Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry, uh, and to all the organizers. And I want to thank you all for coming out today. So what I thought I'd do maybe is, uh, before I start off, let me ask you guys. How many of you are currently routinely using CMR in your practice? Raise your hand. OK, a few hands go up. How many of you occasionally have used it in your practice? OK, a few. How many of you uh, are aware of it but don't use it in your practice? And how many of you don't know what CMR stands for? OK, so, so we've got a mixture here. So, so my goal here is in these next 15 minutes is to try to talk to you about what, how CMR can help you in managing your patients with heart failure. Now, obviously, I think you've probably already heard this today, which is that when it comes to heart failure, the first thing you want to know is what's the LV function? What's the LV ejection fraction? And obviously, the reason for that is because that helps you to, to identify whether the patient has heart failure with reduced EF or heart failure with preserved EF. And obviously, echocardiography is going to be the mainstay technique that you utilize for your initial assessment of LV function. But the reality is that we know that there are times when uh, echo may be suboptimal. You may have poor image quality. You may have uh, uh, you know, challenges with uh, uh, proper endocardial border definition. Uh, and we also know that some of the limitations of echo are that it requires some geometric assumptions to derive assessments of LV function. So in a case like this, uh, which I didn't go through too hard to find, uh, you can't really tell a whole lot, right? And so it's cases like this where there may be a role for a thing like the MRI. So obviously you all know about the echo. Think of it as the big papa here. The MRI scanner is just like the one that you use to do brain imaging or, or knee imaging, but it requires special coils and special software. The patient lays on the table here and then goes inside the bore of the scanner. Uh, and, and the typical acquisition time is about an hour or so to do. And our goal really with CMR is to give you really high quality images, okay? And so not only does it give you very high spatial and temporal resolution, uh, very good signal to noise, uh, and really a free choice of imaging plane. So you can essentially, you're not worried about a rib being in the way or something else, or lungs or anything else. And then lastly, we can quantify uh, contractile function without the need for any geometric assumptions. So what I say is that really in all cases, we should be able to get images that look like this or fairly close to this, uh, as long as a patient can physically fit into the scanner. OK, so how, do, how is it that we uh, obtained uh, LV function? So we actually will do a series of short axis slices from the base of the heart all the way down to the apex of the heart. So you can see here, in this heart, there's about seven or eight slices. And then we basically will go through and contour the endocardium and diastole, do the exact same thing in systole. And then from that, when you summate these, you get end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, stroke volume, and ejection fraction. And again, the beauty of this technique is there's no geometric assumptions that are being made. And in fact, there's fairly good validation data uh, which is covered up here, but showing both in the in vivo uh, as well as in the uh, in vitro settings, uh, fairly good accuracy and precision of CMR measurements of uh, LV function. Now, probably the second thing you want to know besides LV function is, what is the underlying cause of this uh, heart failure? And, and really, it's basically, does the patient have coronary disease or non, no coronary disease? And obviously, Angiography, again, is going to be your first line modality in most cases to try to determine if the patient has CAD or not. But there's, there are situations in which uh, you may not want to proceed onto angiography. And this, I think, highlights the importance, which is that people who have ischemic heart failure have a worse prognosis than people who have non-ischemic heart failure. And so the question is, is there a role for CMR in helping you to identify whether it's ischemic or non-ischemic heart failure? And we know that this is important both from a, a prognosis standpoint as well as from a management standpoint. So in fact, what I'm going to talk about most of this talk is this technique called late gadolinium enhancement CMR, or LGE. And this is a technique whereby we administer gadolinium contrast, and the gadolinium goes to areas where there's myocardial infarction or myocardial fibrosis. And it appears basically when we do this technique as areas of bright or hyper-enhanced areas. And you can see in this person here who has a subendocardial infarction here in the anterior wall versus another example here who has a transmural infarction in the anterior and anterior septal wall affecting the full thickness of the myocardium. And I think the unique thing about this technique, and again, to give you an idea of the scale, this is something that, that was developed about 15 years ago. So it's a relatively new technique. Uh, but the resolution that you get here uh, is on the order of about one and a half millimeters. So we're able to image about a gram of tissue, of myocardial tissue. So you're able to detect myocardial scar with really exquisite resolution. 
Uh, and so there's actually been several studies that have looked at just patients presenting with chronic heart failure and can, si can simply doing this delayed enhancement CMR uh, help you to ident identify whether they have ischemic or non-ischemic heart failure. And in fact, these studies show that in the setting of chronic heart failure, ischemic uh, etiology is almost always associated with the evidence of late gallium enhancement by CMR, uh, with a sensitivity here of anywhere from 98 to 100 percent. Um, in addition to that, we can use that information in people who have coronary disease to try to actually help to identify those that are most likely to improve contractile function with revascularization versus those that are not. And again, this is kind of the classic uh, publication from New England Journal uh, in 2000, which looked at this technique and looked at the extent of hyperenhancement within any given segment and what its likelihood of improvement in contractility was after revascularization, be it percutaneous or surgical. And what was shown, in fact, was that for those segments that have no hyperenhancement, there's a very high likelihood of improvement in contractile function after revascularization. On the flip side, for those segments with more than 75% hyperenhancement that we would say is transmurally infarcted, uh, there was essentially no likelihood of improvement in contractile function. So we have a technique now which we can use to not only identify the presence of myocardial infarct, but also to predict the likelihood of improvement in contractility after revascularization. Now the next question may come, well, what about patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy? So one of the unique things about this technique is because of the high resolution, not only are you able to identify that there's fibrosis present, but we can actually look at the pattern of the fibrosis. And so one of the things that we know is that in the setting of ischemic heart disease, injury presents in this wavefront phenomenon where if you acutely cause an infarct, initially you'll get subendocardial damage, and then it progresses to the mid-myocardium, and then over time, after about six to 12 hours, it extends all the way out to the epicardium until it becomes transmural. Now, the issue is what if we see a pattern of fibrosis or hyperenhancement that's in the middle of the myocardium? That's a clue that this is not due to coronary disease, that this is due to something else. What if we see a pattern of fibrosis that's epicardial, so in the outer wall of the myocardium, or we see a pattern that's diffuse, global subendocardial, obviously this would not, you know, you would, you would be unusual to get this due to coronary artery disease. And so in the setting of non-ischemic, we actually look at the pattern of the enhancement, and that can actually help us to identify potentially the underlying etiology of the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Why is this important? Well, we know that depending upon the etiology, the prognosis can be very different. And so what I'm going to do now is actually walk you through, and, and obviously I don't have time to go through all of these different types of cardiomyopathy and how CMR can be helpful, but I'm going to pick a few to highlight. But I think it's important to point out that, that we should not stop with just saying this is a, a idiopathic non-ischemic. Rather, I think with MRI, we can actually nail down the diagnosis a little bit further, which again is going to help us both from the standpoint of prognosis uh, as well as potentially from the standpoint of management. So here's an example of a patient with uh, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can see hypertrophy, which is really primarily in the apical segments. And in these patients, oftentimes, you'll see fibrosis in those hypertrophied apical segments. And frequently, they can actually get an infarct as well in that apical ca cap. And again, this is likely due to trapping of, of uh, blood uh, by obstruction here, leading to extremely high pressures in that uh, very apical cap region. In patients with the uh, kind of the standard garden variety type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which affects more the interventricular septum, as we can see here on the cine images, the septum is much thicker than the lateral wall. Uh, we also see a pattern of enhancement or fibrosis in these patients. But again, this is not what you would see with coronary disease. This is really a pattern that's kind of in the septum at the RV insertion sites. And this is, again, the classic pattern that you see with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this not only aids in diagnosing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but also provides prognostic implication. And there was a large uh, series that was published a couple years ago, which demonstrated that increasing extent of LGE in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is associated with an increased risk of sudden death and also uh, with uh, an increasing risk of uh, end-stage heart failure uh, secondary to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as well. Um, so again, really the role here in Holcomb is, is to identify patients that are at increased risk for sudden death, as well as patients that uh, may be uh, at increased risk for end-stage Holcomb. Uh, let me skip on now to another condition, uh, and this is not, again, a, a 
totally uncommon condition. This is the uh, Takasubu's cardiomyopathy. And again, there's the classic Mayo Clinic criteria that are shown here. I'm not going to go into those in detail. What I'll show you is that CMR actually can help us in kind of further assessing this. And so this was actually a very nice study out of a European uh, a series of, of centers, multi-center, over 200 patients that looked at patients that presented with suspected Takasubus. And what they found, interestingly, was although most patients, uh, about uh, 80 over 80 percent, had the classical apical ballooning syndrome, there were about 17 percent that had more of a mid-wall ballooning pattern. And in fact, there was a small percentage, 1 percent, that had actually an inverted ballooning pattern where the basal segments were affected, but the apical segments were, in fact, spared. And then in addition to that, um, what they also found was that in about a third of patients, the RV was also affected as well. So again, I think with the use of CMR, it helps us to kind of better understand uh, some of these conditions. Uh, and I think we, we've begun to realize that, that although we think of it, the apex as being the classic area affected, that may not always be the case. In addition to that, in this study, when they did the late gadolinium enhancement CMR, looking for fibrosis or injury in the myocardium, they really did not find any in these patients with uh, Takasubus. So again, you significant wall motion abnormality, but the absence of any evidence of myocardial damage by CMR. Um, and in fact, what they found in these patients was when they br were brought back for follow-up, uh, as we know from other ECHO studies, there's a significant improvement in LVEF at follow-up in these patients, as well as a reduction in LV volumes uh, and improvement in LV uh, remodeling. Uh, now let's turn to another condition, which is myocarditis. And this is actually one of the classic studies came out a little over 10 years ago from Germany, which looked at a series of patients that presented with myocarditis. And you'll see again these patterns of enhancement, epicardial in the lateral wall, epicardium involving the lateral wall and the septum. Uh, this is kind of a more of a mid-myocardial pattern. This is a pattern involving the septum. But again, none of these are subendocardial based. And that's one of the clues when you see this, that this doesn't fit with what you would see with coronary artery disease. Now, what's interesting about the study, and the reason I highlight this, was because in this study, they actually went through and did biopsies in the left ventricle at the site where they saw hyperenhancement in all these patients. And what they found was that if you biopsy at the site of the hyperenhancement, over 90% of the time, they were able to identify the presence of active virus, either parvovirus or herpes uh, type 6 virus. Um, and so again, I think this now, uh, in many places, has become a gatekeeper to identify patients that you're suspecting of myocarditis, because if the MRI comes back completely normal with no evidence of hyperenhancement at all, that makes the diagnosis of myocard myocarditis uh, much, much less likely. And I think there's further supporting data for that statement, which is there's prognostic data as well looking at patients suspected, uh, presenting with suspected myocarditis, and if they have any, any hyperenhancement at all, the prognosis is much worse than if you see no evidence of hyperenhancement on the CMR. Uh, and then really looking both at a cumulative endpoint, uh, as well as all-cause death, cardiac death, or sudden cardiac death. Um, let's move on to another condition, and here's one that, uh, you, you know, what we see here, if we just look at the CINE images, there's a small pericardial fusion, there's left ventricular hypertrophy, there's probably some RVH as well, there's uh, uh, mild LV dysfunction with the EF, I think we measured about 47%, and mild RV dysfunction as well with the RV EF of 38%. But I think on the basis of this alone, this is not diagnostic of anything per se. It's a patient with heart failure, we say certainly he's got a thick heart, could this be bad hypertensive heart disease, could this be amyloid, could this be something else? I think when we then give our galenium contrast and do the late uh, enhancement CMR, what you notice is that there's diffuse contrast uptake everywhere, right? The LV's got diffuse uptake, the RV shows diffuse hyperenhancement, even in fact the atrial walls show, show hyperenhancement as well, and this now is a very specific finding for amyloidosis. So again, I think this takes you beyond suspecting something and actually helps you to get a diagnosis. And then there's prognostic data as well showing, in fact, that if you look at patients with proven extra cardiac amyloidosis by fat pad biopsy, uh, if you have no evidence of LGE in the heart, that can be effectively used to rule out uh, cardiac amyloid involvement, whereas if you have uh, LGE in the, in the heart by CMR, prognosis is much worse, uh, indicative of cardiac amyloid. And in fact, the, the presence or absence of LGE was a better stratifier of prognosis than, in fact, New York Heart Association class, because you can see even patients with class 1, still the prognosis was not that great. 
Uh, and then this is just a follow-on study that we did in a multi-center fashion, demonstrating essentially the same findings uh, across a series of four sites. Uh, in the interest of time, let me wrap up here. Uh, also patients presenting with cardiac sarcoid, and, and these patients present to the CMR lab in two ways. They have a known diagnosis of extra cardiac sarcoid, and they're coming to see if there's cardiac involvement. And again, by using this late gallium enhancement CMR technique, we see if there's fibrosis present. And in this study, they demonstrated that one, there's very variable patterns of fibrosis uh, in the setting of, of sarcoidosis, uh, but that the prevalence of fibrosis by CMR is much higher than what you would get based on the clinical uh, criteria for sarcoidosis, so suggesting it may be more prevalent. Um, and in fact, when you look at prognosis, and again, these are patients with known extra cardiac sarcoidosis, uh, the, the presence of any hyperenhancement by CMR is associated with a much worse outcome than those who don't have evidence of cardiac involvement based on CMR. And then let me wrap up here. Um, in the final group, which is in patients with uh, truly idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, um, where there's no other secondary cause, what we find in these patients is that anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of these patients, depending upon your cohort, may in fact have uh, evidence of hyperenhancement, but it tends to affect the mid myocardium in the basal and mid septum. And this actually, though, is associated with an adverse prognosis. So even if it's an idiopathic non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, if there's this mid-wall fibrosis, the prognosis in these individuals is much worse than those who don't have evidence of, of fibrosis. And this was a, a single-center study from a group out in England. Uh, and then this is now results from a multi-center uh, uh, or meta-analysis of uh, studies from six or seven different sites, again showing in idiopathic cardiomyopathy, the presence of uh, hyperenhancement or scar by CMR is associated with the worst all-cause mortality, heart failure hospitalization, as well as sudden cardiac death. And so this is kind of a schema which kind of outlines the differing patterns of hyperenhancement that we may see by CMR and helps you to kind of further narrow down your differential diagnosis into potential etiologies. So to wrap up, you know, what is the role for CMR in heart failure? I think first and foremost is accurate assessment of LV function and volumes, uh, which can help you to distinguish HEF-PEF from HEF-REF. It can be to help identify ischemic versus non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And then lastly, the fibrosis that we see by CMR with gallinium enhancement CMR can aid both in diagnosis as well as in assessing prognosis in these patients. Thank you for your attention.